Last week I started a, uh, a, a theme, a topic, which was had to deal with decision making. How do you make your decisions? We, we, we're faced making decisions every single day. We have to make big decisions. And somebody said, if you make the right big decisions, all the small decisions will take care of themselves. Um, many people would, just this week I came across a lady said, I have so many problems, I need, I need to know what to do. So I went to what they call in Spain, a pitonesa, which is a lady who kind of looks into a crystal ball and see what the future would say. I said, what did it say? I don't think it, it said anything. Others would say, well, well, I have some friend back in the, the town, a very old lady. She sacrifices a chicken and then opens up the chicken and reads the, the, the liver. How can you read the liver? I mean, maybe the, the liver will tell you what to do in the future. Others would just have done a nice cup of tea and then read the tea leaf, leaves in, in, the, in the cup. Uh, left in the cup. How do you make your decisions? Last week I gave, I went into Google and it just typed decision making. And it gave me a very interesting extract of how to make decisions. And it said this, decision making is the process of making choices by identifying a decision, gathering information, and assessing alternative resolutions. Using a step-by-step -step decision making process, can help you make more deliberate, thoughtful decisions by organizing uh, relevant information and defining alternatives. And then he gives seven steps. I'm not going to uh, go to the definition of each one, but it, the first one was identify the decision. Second, gather relevant information. Identify the alternatives. Weigh the evidence. Choose among alternatives. Take action. And then last, review your decisions and its consequences. Any, any problems with that? Does it offer us all the alternatives? Remember I gave you a story in Luke chapter 12 of a man who probably had all these points uh, uh, very well laid down. He had a wonderful harvest and he said, boy, how am I gonna, how am I gonna hold all this? Where am I gonna put all my gain? And he started calculating, thinking, well, this is what I'm gonna do. I need a bigger real estate. I need bigger barns. I need bigger um, um, graneros. I'm not sure how you say that in English. Barns. What's that? Barns. Well, it said barns. Granaries. Granaries, that's it. And uh, at the end of his decision making, this is what I'll do, came the voice of the Lord and said, But God said, You fool, this night I will take your soul. This afternoon we'll be looking at another passage, and I'd like you to open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 31, and we'll be reading from verse 11, most likely all the way to verse 42. We'll start with verse 11, <clears throat> and I think this passage gives us very good information on how to go about making decisions. Chapter 31, and we'll start reading in verse 11. And the angel of the Lord spake unto me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, Here I am. And he said, Lift up now thine eyes, and see all the rams which leap up upon the cattle are rent straightened, speckled, and grist. For I have seen all that Laban doth unto thee. I am God of Bethel, where thou anointed the pillar, and where thou vowedest a vow unto me, now arise, get thee out from this land, and return into, unto the land of thy kindred. And Rachel and Leah answered and said unto him, Is there yet any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? We are not counted of him strangers, for he had told us and had quite devoured also our money. For all the riches which God had taken from our father, that is ours and our children's now then, whosoever had, had said unto thee, do. And Jacob rose up and set his sons and his wives upon camels, and he carried away all his cattle and all his go uh, goods which he had gotten, and uh, the cattle and his uh, getting, 
which he had begotten, with which he had gotten in Pandanara, for to go to Isaac his father in the land of Canaan. And Laban uh, went to shear his sheep, and Rachel had stolen the image, uh, that images that were her father's, and Jacob st uh, stole away unawares to Laban the Syrian, and that he told him not that he fled. So he fled with all that he had, and rose up, and passed over the river, and set his face towards the Mount Gilead. And it was told Laban, uh, Laban, sorry, reading this in Spanish, on the third day that Jacob was fled. And he took his brethren with him, and pursued after him seven days' journey. And they overtook him in the Mount of Gilead. And God came to Laban, uh, the Syrian, in a dream by night, and said unto him, Take heed that thou speakest not to Jacob, either good or bad. Then Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the mount, and Laban, with his brethren, uh, pitched in the mount of Gilead. And Laban said to Jacob, What hast thou done, that thou hast stolen away unawares to me, and carried away my daughters, as captives taken with a sword? Wherefore did, uh, didst thou flee away secretly, and steal away from me? And didst not tell me that I might have sent thee away with myrrh, and with songs, and tablets, and harps, and hast not suffered me to kiss my sons and my daughters? Thou hast now done foolishly in so doing. It is in the power of my hand to do you hurt, but God uh, but the God of thy father spake unto me yesterday, saying, Take thou heed that thou speakest not to Jacob either good or bad. And now, though thou wouldest need be gone, because thou sore longest after my father's house, yet wherefore hast thou stolen my gods? And Jacob answered and said to Laban, Because I was afraid, for I said, Peradventure thou wouldest take my force, <laughs> By forth the, thy daughters from me, with uh, whosoever thou findest uh, thy gods, let him not live. Before a uh, brethren discern thou wast, now this is pretty uh, hard uh, English, uh, King James English. Well, I think you, I think you know the story. The story goes on all the way to verse 42. And I find here a very interesting passage that I extracted three points that I think will help us in our decision making. Remember, Sometimes you need to make a very difficult decision that will condition everything in your life. For example, what am I going to, uh, how should I serve the Lord in any way? Uh, should I serve Him just in a mediocre way, in a, in, a, in a good way, in a very good way, in an excellent way? How much am I, am I going to put in in my service to God? Maybe you need to make decisions on your occupation. What job am I going to take? Uh, who am I going to marry? That's an important one. That can condition you for the rest of your life. Or maybe a purchase of your, of your home. Or training your children. What, how am I going to do it? Am I just going to give them a secular education? Or am I going to uh, spend the time to give them a good Christian education? And many parents are just uh, driven to give them a good secular education. They find that later on in their years they have a rebel in their hands. Um, what uh, separation standards am I going to hold to? Uh, what kind of entertainment am I going to am I going to give myself to? How about my giving? Am I going to be a faithful giver? Am I going to be faithful in my tithes, giving my tithes and offerings? These are all areas of decision that we need to make. And here we find in this chapter that Jacob too had to make decisions. And so we find here three things, three actions that we must take. We're going to follow the Lord effectively. One is listen to God carefully. Again, I go back to the, this Google description of making decisions. There's one thing missing there. What does God have to say about it? And pray. Thank you very much, Kathy. What does God, and waiting on God to give you some kind of answer. Maybe you want to go beyond just praying. Maybe you want to... Uh, yeah, well, you want to bring everything before the Lord, but you want to maybe you want to need counsel of, of of men and women who have a good track record, who have experience. Uh, but 
first of all, we need to listen to God carefully. This means that we need to have communion with God and, and, and allow the Lord to speak to us in order to uh, get, make good decisions. Secondly, the thing I, I find in this passage is once the Lord is giving you guidance, obey the Lord completely. Uh, this will take faith. You need to stay to take steps of faith. Follow, follow, follow the leading of the Lord. And then trust God unwaveringly. When you decide to follow the Lord, you know you're going to find immediately what? Problems. Opposition. Every time I study one of the patriarchs and they try to follow the Lord in some way, immediately opposition came about. So trust the Lord unwaveringly. Prepare for opposition, which means that we need to resist the devil and we need to wear God's armor. Let's have a word of prayer. Let's ask the Lord to bless this message, and I hope this will help us in our decision making. I've been a pastor of this church now for over 26 years, and believe me, I've seen very bad decisions uh, taking place here among some of the uh, brethren. And uh, lately, I've, we've had, I've had to give counsel to others uh, having to make very tough decisions. So when it comes to making decisions, remember that every decision you make brings consequences. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for your word. This is truly a, a, a light, Lord, to our minds and our hearts. And it illumines our path. It shows us the direction we need to take. But it also tells us that we need to step out by faith, that we need to trust you. <clears throat> We won't have all our answers, all our questions answered. But Lord, as we walk uh, with you, you will surely give us the answers uh, through the way. And I pray that Lord, this afternoon you will help me be able to deliver this message, help me be very, very clear, help me be biblical in my exposition. And Lord, help us to glean out of this message uh, understanding that will help us later on in making whatever decisions. Well, maybe we won't have to make a decision right now, but somebody will come to us asking for counsel. Uh, this here will be good advice to give them. Be with us now this afternoon, Lord, and give me the power of the Holy Spirit to deliver this message. In Jesus' name, amen. The first one I have here is, and this is what I, I see with, uh, uh, with uh, Jacob. He listened to God when God said, uh, Jacob, get up and go. He... He was already communion with God about his decision. Look with me in chapter 31, verse uh, 3. This, and the Lord said unto Jacob, Return unto the land of thy fathers and thy kindred, and I will be with thee. Notice verse 11. Just jump a few verses over. And in verse 11 it says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, Here I am. And later on in verse 13, read with me in verse 13. It says, I am... The, the, the God of Bethel, where thou anointest the pillar, and where thou vowest a vow unto me, now, it's a moment of action, arise and get thee up from this land, and return unto the land of thy kindred. Now, most people, when they read this, if they don't know the rest of the story, they would think that from there on, it's going to be rosy red all the way uh, to Canaan. If God said, arise and go, it means it's going to be trouble-free. It means that God is going to be with me and he's going to remove all the obstacles. Everything's going to be wonderful. Three times we see the Lord there coming through saying, the Lord said, the Lord spake. And then very clearly said, get up and move. And the thing about Jacob that I find very encouraging is that he heard and did exactly that. Again, he didn't have all the answers. He went prepared. He knew his father-in-law. And he knew that he wasn't just going to say, okay, go, don't worry about it. I'm not going to even, I'm not going to do anything about it. He knew that there was problems coming, but he trusted the Lord more than the situation, the, the, the adversity that, he, uh, that was in front of him. We see that Jacob talked to God, heard God's words, and listened carefully. And when we need to make decisions, it is not going, um, uh, it is not going to be probably through a dream. It's not going to be direct, really. It's not going to be through look, looking at a crystal ball or reading uh, tea leaves, or going to the Pitonessa, as we say here, and see what she has to say, uh, reading the cards or anything like that. Um, we have 31,102 verses in the Bible, and that gives us direction. 
Why don't we go to the Bible? I've heard the folks say, well, I, I, I normally just look at out in a, in a cloudy day, see if I can see the, a form that would uh, show me uh, maybe uh, uh, some form that would give me some guidance. Uh, you say, Pastor, that would never happen. It's happened to me. I've had a young lady one time said, oh, I, I know what I need to do with my life right now. I saw this wonderful cloud that had a, the shape of a lamb, and I, and I interpreted this as the Lord showing me the way in my decision. And then she went on and on and said, that was just a cloud. <laughs> and, and some folks say, you know, about my dreams. If you ever study how God spoke through dreams, you only see a handful of verses. Most of the time, the Lord spake through word. And if you think about maybe a vision, I'll just, hopefully the Lord would give me a vision. Well, how are you going to interpret that vision? How do you know what the Lord's going to say? What the Lord's really trying to say? We have, again, 31,102 verses. Let's get into the Bible, and let's look into the Bible to find the method or the ways in making decisions, proper decisions. So you need to listen to God carefully. You need to commune with God. Let me give you a few verses that, that, that helps us that shows us the importance of seeking direction from God. In Psalm 119, 24, it says this, Thy testimonies are my delight and my counselors. So here's the psalmist saying, You know where I go for information? You know where I go for wisdom? I go into the scriptures. And then in Psalm 109, verse 105, it says, The word is a lamp unto my feet. It shows me where I am right now. And a light onto my path. It just shows me, shows me enough light that I can take a few steps. And if you decide to step out by faith, you say, well, I only have a few. The, the light only goes a few meters. Well, walk those few meters. And then the Lord will start opening the light even more. In Psalm 119, 130 says the, the, the entrance, which means the exposition in the Spanish Bible, is translated exposition, the entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. I love, I love that the translation in Spanish more than the word entrance. It doesn't really explain, at least with my English understanding, uh, what entrance means, but it means exposition. It's what we try to do with the scriptures, expose the scripture, open them up. So it is the it, it, uh, exposing, the ex exposition of thy words that giveth light. It gives me understanding. The word in Hebrew, correct me if I'm mistaken, Brother Tim, petach, something like that. Petach, it's very, very hard to pronounce. Which means an opening, a disclosure. It's like drawing the sword to be uh, easily seen. Uh, and that's, I think, why we love expository preaching more than anything, because this is what we do. We, ex we bring it out, make it clear, so that we can understand. In Proverbs 6, verse 23, it says, for the, for the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. You know what the way of life is? This. This is the way of life. The Lord has given us the, His wonderful word that helps us understand, again, 31,102 verses that speak very clearly about giving us direction. Let's go to the Bible. Also, we need to spend quality time in our knees, praying. Uh, Kathy went like that, very well expressed. Sp uh, seeking the Lord. If you're hiding some sin in your life, maybe you want to start by saying, Lord, uh, I need to get this out of the way before I can even uh, come before you. But we need to spend quality time on our knees um, <coughs> in, in order to help us, help the, in order to uh, seek the Lord to help us clear uh, the way, you know, to um, also when he gives us his promises, to be able to claim his promises. Uh, I find a very interesting, a couple of verses in the book of Joshua. Uh, if you remember the, uh, the book of Joshua, talking is mainly about conquering the promised land. Once Joshua comes into Cana, the first thing they find is this incredible fortress that nobody had ever been able to bring down. And Joshua is, is uh, in front of this, uh, wondering, well, how in the world are we going to do this? We don't have trained military men. We don't, we're not men of war, though they were uh, 
good, uh, they, they were able to defend their families. How are we going to do this? And God gave them an interesting strategy to bring um, uh, uh, the fortress down. It was an amazing victory. The walls went, instead of collapsing inward, they collapsed outward. And the Israelites were able to go in there and bring and, and, and take the city. Immediately after that, they, uh, Joshua looked at the little town over there called Ai. And he said, okay, you go, just, just, just take a few men and, 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 and just take care of that. Well, those men went up there and they were beaten bad. And they came back with several uh, men who had lost their lives. And, and Joshua wrecks his clothes and starts crying out to the Lord, Lord, why? And the Lord says, and, and Jacob, I mean, uh, Joshua, it's not time now to pray, it's time to clean camp. A clean camp. And you would think, well, they learned a lesson. But just if you move a few chapters forward into chapter 9, we find an interesting situation where some men called the Gabionites, those Gabionitas, uh, they disguised themselves and to deceive Israel. They didn't want to get into a war with them. So they said, let's deceive them by making them think that we've been in, on, on a journey for a long, long time uh, where they can trust their eyes and uh, maybe they will make a pact, maybe they will make a, some covenant with us. And in Joshua chapter 9, verse 14, we see this, this thing. It says, and the men took of their victuals and that's not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. Bad decision. Not going to the Lord first. Not bad decision for thinking that Ai was small enough for them to take it. They soon realized that the victory they had over Jericho was not something of their doing. It was the Lord. And this little city was also something that the Lord would have to uh, speak to them about. And there with the Gabonites, you know, trusting the rise instead of trusting the Lord, instead of going to the Lord for, for counsel, they just trusted their eyes. They trusted their own experience. In Psalm 32, 8, we have this verse, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I, notice this, I will guide thee with mine eye. Have you ever done that with your kids? You say, well, tonight we have to go and see the Joneses. And Marisa said this to our two kids. He said, when I, you know, there'll be moments where you, I know you guys, you'll start being noisy and not behave. So when I look at you, when I do this look, you know, it means you're, you're in trouble. Stop doing it. And God would say, okay, mommy, you want to understand. And Adrian would say, uh, yeah, okay, mom. And then we'll go to the Joneses and <coughs> they go up to very hyper kids. They're very soon, they'll start making, you know, <laughs> Things like that, and Mama would give him the look. And Adrian, especially Adrian, would look back and thinking, Why is she looking at me this way? <laughs> and she can, you know, do it again, and they wouldn't get the point. They didn't remember what Mom said. And later on at home, she gave him the look at a paddle also at the end. She said, You know, I'm guiding you. Now, there has to be a very clear relationship between, between us. In order for you to understand the message, I'm looking at you, that should be enough for you to understand that you're not going in the right direction. Something wrong is going on and you need to change your attitude. Well, the Lord says that we need to have the, that kind of relationship when, when He kind of looks at us in a certain way or you know, impresses us in a certain way that we should say, okay, it's time to pray. It's time to insult God. It's time for me to come before Him and say, Lord, what, why are you, what are you trying to tell me? And there's great connection and attentiveness for once, from one's part to follow someone by the direction of their eyes. You know, we, the Lord is not um, stingy when He comes to giving us wisdom. He says He wants to give it to us liberally. But we need to come to Him. In James chapter 1, verse 5, it says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally. That's the only place where I like the word liberally. <laughs> And upbraideth not, and it shall be given. Come with confidence to him. Lord, I'm really seeking your counsel. I really know. But don't say, I've already made the decision. I want to know if you agree with it. That too, I've experienced in the church. 
years ago, a couple were uh, thinking about moving town, and they had, or I knew because somebody else told me that they had already made the decision and everything was kind of rolling towards making it. But they said, Pastor, we want to talk to you about a decision we want to make. And we met here, and they told us of the, of the you know, what I felt about it. They said, well, I see several problems with that decision. And I gave them the problems, and I said, I don't think it's really a good decision. You haven't had this and this and this and this in consideration. And they looked at each other, they looked at me, and both of them said, thank you very much, Pastor, we're going. <laughs> and I told them, I said, I knew you're gonna, I know, I know you already made it. You were just, you didn't come to me to give you counsel. You came to me to see if I agreed with your decision. You know, sometimes we can deceive ourselves that way. In order for you to receive guidance, make sure you go to the scripture. Make sure you have a, a proper relationship with the Holy Spirit. And he will guide you through that uh, still, small voice. Listen to the sermons. I hope you're listening to this one. It'll help you next time you have to make an important decision. Now, my own experience when we had to make a big decision, leaving a very secure job that I had with a U.S. military base in Madrid. I had, you know, if you're looking, if you were looking for the perfect job, I had the perfect job. It took me 19 years to work myself onto, into that perfect job. From 8 to 4.30, Saturdays and Sunday off, 14 checks a, a year, 30 days of holiday paid, and uh, extra paycheck on, on, in August. And uh, rewards here and there and everywhere, because they, the boss that I had was very, very considered. And he said to me one day, he says, you know, as long as the job is done, I don't care what you do. Really? <laughs> yeah, if the job is, you know, if you got your job done, I don't care if you're not at your, de at your desk. You know, th it, it was like he said, Lord, thank you so much for putting me in a place like that. And then the Lord started working in us, especially me, about leaving my job and going into missions. You know what that meant? That meant I would have to drop my job. It didn't mean that I would have secure pay every month. It meant that we would have to drive many, many miles all over Spain and Europe and later on in the United States, living at a suitcase, hoping that the Lord would help us, give us enough money to go to make it to the next church and make a presentation. Boy, was that a big decision. My wife looked at me like, I hope you know what you're doing. You say you received God's calling. God has not called me yet. <laughs> I'm waiting for the phone to ring. If you know Melissa, you know how her eyes speak louder than her mouth of words. When I told my family, they said, are you crazy? My brother, which was my closest brother, told me, he said to me one day, he said, Sammy, this is the biggest mistake you're going to make in your life. You know, my family thought I was crazy. My brother knows now that I'm crazy. My wife, I don't know what she's thinking. My kids, I'm thinking, looking at them and wondering, how are we going to make it through these two and a half years of, of the deputation? It was a very, very difficult decision to make. We didn't know if we were going to ever make it to, to Andalusia and be able to establish the church that you see now here. Very difficult decision, full of obstacles. Many times I fell in depression thinking, Lord, I... Uh, maybe, just maybe, it was a bad mistake. Only for later on, for the Lord confirmed, he said, trust me, Sam, just keep on moving. So you see, this message is not just for you, it's for me. And, it, and you know, the, I'm 67 years old now. You say, well, you don't have to make any more decisions. At the age of 67, there will be more decisions to make. I tell you, there's going to be many more. And I better remember these things that I'm preaching to you. It's for all of us. Who knows that the Lord might bring somebody from this group to go to the mission field. And you think, well, you know, I worked my way into having a secure job, secure uh, 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 income, and now I'm going to have to live by faith. I don't think so. But, you know, after 30, 30 years in ministry, 26 years on the road, and later on, you know, about 36 years of serving the Lord, He's never failed me. 
never, never failed me. In fact, he's prospered me in so many ways, not just the, uh, the family wise or the kids, wonderful kids are wonderful. Today, 16th of June, I better remember it, is my anniversary. But he said, I have been married now for 40, she was very careful here to clear this. I said, how do you, we, we've been married for 43 years. He says, 44. <laughs> I remember the day, but I didn't remember the years. You were close. I was very close, thank you very much. I was getting better. I, there was a time where I couldn't remember. You know, there'll be circumstances, and there'll be people who will come and say, you are making a big mistake. But if the Lord is leading you that way, trust Him all the way through. So commune with God about your decision. Seek counsel. You're not left alone. And here in chapter 31, if you look with me at verses 14 through 16, it says, And Rachel and Leah answered and said unto him, Is there yet any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? Are we not counted of him strangers? For he had sold us, and had quite devoured also our money. For all the riches which God had taken from our father, that is ours, and our children, now then, what's, notice what she says at the end of verse 16, whatsoever God has said unto thee, do. Daddy's is not going to stay home and think, oh, my daughters have left. No, he's, he's been, now this man is a man of trouble. They know by experience, Jacob knows that this man has caused him so many problems. He's not just going to let him go with cattle and his two daughters and grandkids? Forget it. Laban is going to do something about this. Who, who knows? Maybe he, he might get violent. Jacob had no security of what Laban was going to do. He had his ideas, of course, but he had no, but he said, you know what? We're just going to do what God told us to do. And his wife said, if God, this is what God told you to do. This is what you have to do. Whatever situation occurs, we need to follow the Lord. Let me give you a couple of passages I think will help you. Proverbs eleven fourteen, where no counsel is, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors there is safety. Proverbs twelve fifteen, the way of the fool is light in his own light, in his own eyes. The way of the fool is light in his own eyes. He sees it as the, the perfect way and the only way to do things, but notice what it says, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. So you have the scriptures. You might get some good guidance through sermon, but you still need more details. And what do you do then? Do what the Bible says. Get counsel. Get different, uh, different opinions so you can weigh it out. And make sure, again, that the person you're going to for counsel has a good track record. In other words, they have experience. They, they, they've been there. They know how uh, they can understand the situation. Again, remember the foolish farmer. What did he, did, did he do? He counseled with himself. This is what I'm going to do. I've got control of this. I did it my way, as the song goes. Now I'm going to still do it my way, and this is what I'm going to do. I've got it all figured out. Who can stop me now? I'm going to make it all the way and I'm going to enjoy life. I don't know if you would have known the Costa del Sol, maybe you would have added something else there. And I'll go to the Costa del Sol. I'm only kidding. But you see, God came in and said, you don't understand who gave you the abundance. You sowed the seed. You may have even watered the land. But who gave you the increase? You never, you don't have me in consideration at all. I can, I gave you this, and I can take it away. I can even take your own life away in, in, a, in a flick of a finger. But God said, "You fool! This day will I take your life." We need counsel. In Proverbs nineteen twenty says, "Hear counsel and receive instruction." That thou mayest be wise in the later end. You want to end well? Make sure you have good counselors, good um, mentors. 
I was reading this way, preparing a message. I don't know what I'll bring it, but this right now I'm, I'm feeding for myself. I came across an article that said that only 30% of the men that we met that we know better in Scripture, both Old and New Testament, and in the, in the last couple of centuries, only 30% have ended well. I said, 30%? What happened to the other 70%? And he gave some information there, and it alarmed me that many just simply got dissolution with God. Uh, you, I'm not in agreement with what you had for me in my later years. Others kind of uh, got wounded in the way, um, got discouraged. They got distracted. Others simply uh, got in trouble with sin and ended up losing their life. Only 30% ended well. And when I look at Daniel, for example, when I look at Joshua, when I look at Caleb, these men had tremendous problems in their midst, but they stood with God and made sure that He was to be glorified with everything that they did, and they ended well. That, for me, is a model to follow. I want to end well. I don't know how many years the Lord's going to give me. If He gives me five, I want to live them for the Lord. If it gives me 10, whatever, if it gives me, I don't think I'll be, I'll live over 70, for some reason, I don't know. In fact, if I left early, like Paul, I would say, well, thank you very much, Lord, I'm going home. Really, this is how the, the Apostle Paul felt. If there's any reason for me to stay, I'll stay because of your gain, Paul said. But as far as me, it would be better if I would, the Lord would just take me with him. Whatever the time the Lord gives us here, let, let's make sure that we're making wise decisions and we're using our time to please Him. And I have a name man for that. If you feel it, not, don't, don't say anything. Amen. I hope you say Amen. The most important part of being decision making is being confident that you know the mind of God in the matter. Uh, notice what James one says in verse 6 and 7, but let him ask in faith, not wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Notice this last line, it's very powerful. Let no, uh, for not, let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Don't even think that God is going to give you anything if you come be, before him without faith. You need to trust them. We need to understand God's mind. We need to understand, get to understand Scripture. We need to be able to go to, again, to men and women who, who know the Lord well, who are serving the Lord with all their heart. That, and then find some backup. Ask people to pray for you. This is very important. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. So, listen to God carefully. Second, obey God completely. Step out, step out by faith. If you go back to Genesis chapter 31, if you look with me at verse 17, I find something interesting here. Then Jacob did what? Rose up and set his sons and his wives upon the camel. Kids were going to Canaan. We're leaving this place. Now, I don't know how um, Jacob's kids were. I know how mine were. They want all the answers. Am I going to have this? Am I going to have that? Am I going to have what the house of my room? going to be looking? Am I going to have my own private room? I don't know, kids. All I know is we're going to Monica. <laughs> But where are you going to live? What kind of house? I, 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 I don't know. The wife especially wants to know what kind of dress she's going to be able to put on the curtains, maybe. She's going to have a mall close by. Uh, you know, different people that have different ways of dealing with these type of situations. I don't know what kind of questioning that Jacob had all the way over to this place called Cain that nobody understood where it was. But he stepped out by faith anyway. He went out. He anticipated that Laban would be upset with him leaving. But he obeyed God anyway and left quietly. 
And when God reveals his will, we too must step out by faith and obey God completely. It does not really matter what others think as long as we know that we are following God's direction. If you're still wavering about God's leading, you are not walking by faith, you are walking with doubt, and this does not please the Lord. So we obey God completely, uh, step out by faith, and follow God's leading. Look at verse 18. And he carried away all his cattle and all his goods with which he had gotten, the cattle of his uh, getting, which he had gotten from Padam Aram, for to go to Isaac, his father, in the land of Canaan. The Lord is leading that way, that's where we're going. We don't have all the answers, but we know that this is the place where God wants us. Now, one of the major uh, challenges that he came across was crossing the Ephratus River. And then he proceeded southward, southwest to the east of Galilee, just above the river Jabok. All with his family, his servants, flocks and herds. I'm glad I didn't have to do this when I went on deputation. And then, you know, with time you learn that you don't need so much stuff in your suitcase. Remember the first time we went up to <coughs> Ireland, that, you know, Spain was just kind of a six hour drive and that kind of thing. But then a church in Ireland answered and said, you know, one of our letters, and they said, we want you to come and make a presentation in our church. And I thought, just one church in Ireland? I don't want to go to Ireland just to visit one church? And everything said to me, in, in my flesh it said, no, this is a big mistake. But in, in, in my heart I knew the Lord was saying, trust me. Well, we got, we made a thing, four big suitcases. You know, I don't really know how long we're going to be there. We got there, and uh, we did the presentation in the first church with our wall now, driving back to Spain. We drove then, and uh, realized we had 80% of our clothes unused. We didn't, didn't need that much. Now when we travel, the bag is only this big, and it will last us for a whole week. I think we've learned something in the way. We don't have, don't need that much. But this is a story. Once we got there, trusting the Lord, we only had enough money to get there, by the way. <laughs> you didn't know how we get it back. <laughs> but the pastor after that evening said, uh, by the way, I've got uh, seven other churches in Ireland here in Dublin that would like you to come and present uh, your ministry. Can you stay a month? I said, I don't have a place to stay a month. You can stay with us. We'll take care of you. I told my sister, said, I think we're spending one month in Ireland. He says, the only thing I don't like, it rains all the time, we don't see the sun. But I'll, I'll get used to that. Uh, almost a month later, we were back in Spain, scratching our heads, thinking, how did, how did that happen? We got experience through that. And then later on, we got an answer, one answer, and this is just God's sense of humor. I mean, he doesn't say, Sammy, I got 10 churches laid out for you. Don't worry about anything. This is how, this is the plan, and this is what you're going to do. Don't worry about the money. Don't worry. You know, this is all laid out. It, trust me. No, no. One church, all up in Germany, in a place I've never been before. I don't know any German in a church, in a military church. We got there at 4 o'clock in the morning, and I thought, these people here in Germany are crazy. People are going to work at 4 o'clock in the morning. You don't see anybody at 4 o'clock in the morning in Spain going to work. In fact, you don't see them at 5 or 6 or 7 or 8, but you see them at 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but, it, you know, we knocked at the door very shyly of the address, and the pastor answers, Oh, you're here. Here, the okay, key. You have a prophet's chamber downstairs. Oh, we have a place that. Yeah, it's all prepared for you. Uh, some food there for breakfast tomorrow. And I looked at my niece and said, Well, we're having breakfast tomorrow. I, I didn't think we are going to have breakfast tomorrow because we did. We only had enough money for some. Sandwich bread and cold cuts. That's it. We, would, we didn't have any more money to go back home. Guess what happened? After that, you know, we preached that Sunday, Sunday night, and uh, I thought, well, it's going to be an offering afterwards. We'll have enough money to have breakfast and lunch. <laughs> but the pastor didn't bring that love offering. 
We went back down into the prophet's chamber and said, honey, we're having breakfast tomorrow, but we don't know what's going to happen later. The following morning, we got up, and the pastor knocked at the door and said, oh, by the way, I forgot to give you the love offering. It was enough for us to be able to live on uh, for a whole week. But it wasn't enough to go back to Spain. And he, then he said, and by the way, uh, you have a phone in the prophet's chamber, uh, and here's a list of churches that we have fellowship with in the area. I'm sure they'll be interested in knowing you and getting to know more about your ministry. Why don't you call? That morning I got six meetings with six churches. You know what? All those churches took us on with uh, would support the same one thing with the churches in Ireland. A month later, we got home and we think, wow, this thing called living by faith does work. Trust in the Lord does work. Now, you're not going to always be going through situations like that. It might not be that way with you. But we went through a very extreme situation where we had to trust the Lord for everything all the time. And the Lord came through in such ways that you know, I thought I knew the Lord before traveling, but once we came back, we understood that God never fails. Never fails. Stay right. Listen to God carefully. Obey the Lord completely. And then last, trust God unweaveringly. And which means that you're going to face opposition. Prepare for opposition. Jacob anticipated that Laban would be upset and try to keep him from pursuing his goal. When I was reading this this section this week, I thought, yeah, I remember my family. They, they, they meant the best for me. Okay? They were looking out for me. But they didn't know the Lord. My brother didn't know the Lord. And he was only looking, for, looking out for his uh, kid brother, his baby brother. Cerrito, they call me. <laughs> this crazy brother of mine, my little brother, is going to make a foolish decision. He's, it, it, it took him 19 years to secure this job. It was a, a job for a lifetime. And then you're going to drop all that? that? That was my opposition. And it was a moment of decision when I had to say, Lord, it has to be you all the way. It has to be you all the way. Of course, Laban came, and we see that he threatened them. But he also said, but the Lord also spake to me, saying, don't go against them, let it go. So even though Jacob did not know all the details, God made sure that he took care of the details. My mentor, brother, Dr. J.T. Lyons, said, Sammy, when you go out on deputation, don't try to have all the lines marked, all the dots, you know, don't try to um, plan every detail. Just trust the Lord. Make sure you have everything clear as far as what, what you need to do, where you need to go, when you need to preach, and leave everything else to the Lord. <clears throat> and we did that. And it proved to be very comforting, very secure. And the Lord, in every step of the way, came through with situations that we had never had planned, but the Lord was taking care of them. I'm trying to bring this to a close. Let me give you a couple of verses. Only to help you understand that God is a protector. Psalm 56, 3 says, What time I am afraid, I trust thee. What time I am afraid, when I am afraid, when I am uh, when I don't know what to do, when I'm insecure, he says, when I'm in that situation, what do I do? He says, I, <coughs> excuse me, I trust you. And Psalm 25, 45 says, show me thy ways, O Lord, teach me thy paths, lead me in the truth, and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation, and thee do I wait all the day. You know, you read, I wait all day long for the Lord. Waiting for the Lord doesn't mean wiggling your thumbs all day long doing nothing. It means stay occupied until the Lord shows you the next step to take. But you wait on the Lord, stay busy, wait for the next step. That you. This is where my son Gabriel is right now. And it's very 
it's, it's a very insecure place to be because you really want to move on, but things are not right. So what do I do? Nothing. No. He stays busy with his family. He stays busy in the church. He stays busy contacting people. And until, until the Lord shows you the next step, and he clears the way, stay busy. Wait on him. It doesn't mean do nothing. Pastor, I don't know what else to do with my life. So I'll just wait and do nothing. I'll just come to church and sit there and do. No, no, no. Stay busy. Resist the devil. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee that. Flee, and he will flee from you. And not only resist the devil, make sure you wear God's armor. Ephesians 6 11. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Listen to God carefully. Obey God completely. Trust the Lord unweepingly. And then when the opposition comes, notice what Jacob did. He presented the facts clearly and very courageously. He didn't hide them. He said, this is what we're doing and this is what we're going to intend to continue doing. Yes, we left, but we left because of this situation. And he explained it very, very boldly to Laban. Laban is that kind of individual that's very intimidating. When he's in front of you, it's like, uh, uh, yes, sir, uh, yes, right now, sir. But, you know, when, in, in this situation, Jacob would have just chickened down and said, uh, well, you know, maybe, uh, I don't know what to do, sir. Uh, no, no, he was very straightforward. <clears throat> this is what the Lord has led us to do. This is what we're doing. With you or without you, we must do this. So be very courageous about presenting the facts. Concerning my brother, <clears throat> I told him, Tony, uh, I, I know how to plan to love my life just as much as you do. I love you and I appreciate your care for me. But there's something you don't understand. And it's because you don't have a relationship with God. I must do this. But Sammy, once you're cured, this is what you think when you're, when you're the baby brother, baby out of ten, okay? Not two or three. <laughs> baby brother. They, they all care for you. They, they want to protect you. And it, I know they had good intentions. But I need to trust the Lord. And I said, this is what the Lord has led me to do. And it's uh, this something almost like the three Hebrew children in Babylon, remember? With the fiery, the fiery furnace. If you don't worship me, then you will burn. Well, God can deliver us from that fiery furnace, but if he doesn't, we're not going to worship you. So the Lord can help us through all the way. But if he doesn't, it's okay. You know, Paul, when he had to go do all these missionary travels, he didn't have any security. He probably thought, we're going there, but we don't know if we're coming back. He was trusting the Lord all the way. But for him, it was okay if the Lord left him over there dead. It was okay. And this is something we all need to do all the way. Is it okay to follow the Lord even if he doesn't give you all the things that you want, that you wish? We need to deal with that question. And for me this afternoon, it is very important that we, that we all understand these three points. And I think we can draw them out from chapter 31. Listen to God carefully. Commune with God. Make sure you're doing that now. Seek around others that can give you good counsel. And when you have the direction, <laughs> obey God completely. Obey God completely. Step out by faith. Follow God's lead. And then last, trust God unweaveringly. Be ready for opposition, but don't be afraid of the opposition because we have a great God. Decision making, we all have to make decisions. And I hope that next time you have to make a big decision, you remember these points. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you because we have ample instruction in your word to help us move on. We don't just want to move on, but we want to move on in the right direction. We want to do the right thing. We want to do your will. And Lord, in order for us to be able to do that, we see this afternoon that we have to have a very close relationship with you. We will need to trust you. And we will need to face opposition. Help us, Lord, 
throughout the way, all the way to the end. Lord, may you find in us good servants. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.